and then we'll give it a min another minute or so, and then we'll kick off. Angela, are you going to want me to share the poems, or would that be the easiest? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay. And I thought we would just do them in the order that you listed them, if that works for you. Yep. That's um, kind of why. That's kind of why I put the twenty at the top, and then the extra ones at the back. How many people hope to get to the spring convention? Everybody raise their hand. <laughs> when is it? When is it? April 27, 28. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. Is that the one in Stevens Point or is that something? Um, Manaqua. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Maybe we should make an effort to see if there are ride shares from the southern part of the state. I'd, to, uh, be, up for that. I'd be up for that. That's a long way to go. Yeah. Anybody's in the Northeast, I should say. Well, further from us in the Southeast. <laughs> but if there was a, you know, special sign up or a two, three, four weeks before, Say who's who's willing to take a guest or two, and who's willing to ride. We we might solve some people's transportation problems because it's it's a distance, but it happy that you know the northern people get something close by them for a change. Right. Uh, maybe I'll brainstorm with the other VPs. Yeah. And they can reach out to their their members, and maybe we can come up with some solution for that. That's a good idea. Well, and some of us will cross districts on the way. For instance, I could pick up somebody in Madison or something like that, and that doesn't have to be Southeast, but that would be good. I'd be happy to. Yep. Yeah, the agenda, or, the agenda info about DASHA and the registration, everything is all, all available on the website now. If anybody would like to go after this and learn more. Tori, where are the poems that you said uh, have been posted? Uh, I didn't post them anywhere yet. I just emailed them to you. And I will be sharing them in, like, right now. How about, hopefully I, it lets me do this. All right. Can you see them? Yep. Okay, cool. I did it right. Great. <laughs> okay, so... I'm just going to reintroduce Angela because she is our workshop leader. Angela is a writer, teacher, editor, and community organizer. Her debut collection of poems, Louder Birds, was awarded the Lena Miles Weaver Todd Poetry Prize. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Kenyan Review Online, Best New Poets, Hayden's Fair Review, Memor Memorious New Ohio Review and Prairie Schooner, among other journals and anthologies. She has received grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and Key West Literary Seminar, as well as a fellowship at Writers Room of Boston. She lives with her family in Milwaukee and is a PhD student at UW Milwaukee. Angela, is your book available on your website or where can people get it? It is. Yeah. It is available on my website. And um, also I am a huge lover of your local bookstore, whoever that is. So if you have a small independent bookstore in your area, then that is also a wonderful place. And if they don't have it, you can ask them to order it for you um, and support those, those people too. Okay, sounds good. I'll put links on the website when I post the recording. Awesome, thank you. No problem. Okay, so is Tad on the... Call on the call. I didn't see their name come in. Yes, I am here. Okay, good. <laughs> Would you like to read your poem? Well, it seems like there are about six or eight Lynn Aprils on this recording. <laughs> yes, because when you share, each link is personalized to you, to each registrant. So when you shared, when Lynn shared her link, Everybody signs in on her, but you can go into your information and change the name to your right name. Yeah, I did not realize that they were personalized when some folks reached out over email and were looking for the link. No, and I was going to re reply all and let people know, but I'm like, as long as you guys get in the call, that's the main thing, right? 
Okay, mm -hmm. Tad, take it away. Okay. I'm gonna read from here, my paper copy. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. February winter. A flat place next to the rock in the front flower bed expects bright beaks of daffodils to break soil when earth unfreezes. Chickadees remain quiet, darting from feeder to fur as if they promise not to get my hopes up until earth unfreezes. Daylight feels larger though the sun remains a faint disk in an undecided sky before earth unfreezes. In youth, I would be at the river, pressing bubbling ice under rubber boots. In youth, I would be tramping a crusted beach, hearing crackling, sizzling waves of slush. In youth, I would be hunting deer with my eyes between groves of mm. beech and maple. In age, I am at the window, wondering, mind wandering. Mm -hmm. Great reading, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So I am going to definitely invite everyone to toss in all of the wonderful things about this poem in the chat so that um, Tad has those to look at too. Um, I guess since we're like rapid fire, I feel like I'm just going to jump in right away with everyone. So um, first of all, things that I love, um, the sounds, the language here at Bright bright beaks of daffodils to break soil and the bubbling under rubber boots. Um, all of that is so great. Um, the in youth sections are especially like vivid and intense, like those memories of being young and doing those things, right? Like tramping a crusted beach. Um, I'm like right in that moment. Those images are all so great. Um, I like especially that, you know, we start in this present tense, right? Um, like a flat, a flat place next to the rock in the front flower bed expects bright beaks of daffodils to break soil when earth unfreezes. So we're in the present moment, this is happening. And what I really appreciate is the amount of attention that is given to each of these things that happen in the before, um, or until when the earth unfreezes, all of that attention is the same kind of attention that you can see the speaker grew with. Like the speaker paid that same attention to the world in their youth. And I love that, like how that transitions um, from youth into older age. Um, in the end, I think what I really wanted, um, so in, in age, I'm at the window wondering mind wandering, I think what I was interested in seeing there was something about the, because the first three stanzas end in unfreezes, I was curious about what was happening to the, to the like what happened to this idea of the frozen things. And I wondered if that could maybe be tied back in to the end, mm -hmm. um, just because everything else was like so image heavy that when I got to mind wandering, I did kind of go back to the beginning, but it wasn't as, it didn't hit me as hard as it may have. Um, if there were something maybe about the frozenness or, or the unfreezing, some attention may be given back to that. Or if anybody has any other thoughts on that, um, definitely toss those in the chat. But that's kind of what, where I was thinking. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see, like, what are you seeing out that window? which like, I think I get in the beginning, but just bring me back there. Good. Do you have any questions? That was, I feel like I'm just like, Rah. I, appre I appreciate the observation of the, at the end that something feels missing. I kind of felt that way too. And, and nothing came to me. So I left it that way and but now I know what to attend to perhaps. Wonderful. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. I have to say like just in general, I was overwhelmed by how wonderful all of these were. Um, I really, yes, I enjoyed going through all of them. Okay, so next up is Angela Hoffman. 
shifting delights. No matter the season, time was expansive, wide open, abundant, filled with softness, slowness, even boredom was celebrated. The days of youth were spent outdoors, rooted in holy ground, wonderment in the return of the robin, rhubarb, pastures of buttercups, mud pies and cow pies, endless nights under moonlight, fireflies, cloudless skies, monarchs, milkweed wishes, troves of acorns, hickory nuts, maple leaves to bury in, piles of burning brush, paths forged through tall grasses, precarious houses and trees, first snowfall, ponds scraped and eights by skates, steep hills for sleds, drifts of shrouded silence, angels and men of snow. Time rolled with ease, following nature's lead, seasons marked only by shifting delights, which over time became wasted time, measured time, scarce against the time ticking on the clock. All is relative with seasons. Near the end, I wait again for the return of the robin. Lovely, thank you so much, Angela. Um, yeah, I always enjoy hearing people read their own work. Um, it definitely adds a little extra something, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, again, feel free to toss your comments in that chat. Um, I really appreciated the way the pace works in this poem. Um, it starts off with these like longer lines and, you know, we have complete ideas at the end of each line, like no matter the season, time was expansive, wide open, abundant. There's a lot of kind of time and um, that same softness and slowness mentioned are in that stanza. Um, and I really liked the way that, that I guess the pace was mimicking the information we were getting. Um, and then the same thing happens in that, in that next stanza. Um, the language is so fun, kind of like those days, right? Like celebrating all of these things, um, the rhubarb and the pastures and the buttercups and cow pies even, right? Um, there's so much joy um, and fun in that language. Um, and it also is, kind of a funny spot because it's the lines get longer and there's a lot of stuff jam packed in there, but the pace is kind of fast because of that alliteration. And I think that just like so wonderfully mirrors that time of your life where everything mm -hmm. is just beautiful and exciting, but like compact and then it's done. Like it's moving fast, but also kind of drawn out. Um, so I really love that too. Um, Toward the end, there was a part, so like I loved the repetition of which over time became wasted time and measured time. I loved how that worked. Um, but I think what I wanted between the seasons marked only by shifting delights and that turn into the time section, I think I wanted to be brought into there like what does the wasted what is the wasted time how was time measured um I think because that stanza above is so dense with images um yeah I just I was wondering it, it, because then all of a sudden it's near the end so I guess then what happened in the in the middle even if it's just a little little bit just something in there to to cling on to because I do love the idea of wasted time and measured time, especially that's really, mm -hmm. really good. Thank you. That's a good point. Do you have any questions? Nope. Okay. That, that's helpful. I can work on that. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Marie Chivaco. My thumbs got out of order. Is she on? I'm terribly sorry. I was unmuted. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, no, should, I should have assumed my that. Name is Mary. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. Oh, Mary. Okay. Sorry. Okay, health. 
In the emergency room, the doctor says, like a brother to you, come on, man, I'm begging, let me help. And I, after all these years, having gotten this far, say, I'll leave if you don't. And the doctor, like a lover down on one knee, says, please, he says, please. And you, undone, say yes. Yes to better or worse, till death do us part. At 23, we didn't know what it meant for richer or poorer, in sickness or health. And the doctor, solemn like God in his mystery, leads the way to the ward through another and another and another locked door. Um, I like just, especially I loved reading it anyway, but hearing you read it, I had goosebumps the entire time. So um, in general, there's so much to love here. Um, I am really excited about the way that the doctor um, like in similes transforms from like a brother to a lover to God in his mystery. Um, that, um, that progression is really fascinating. Um, yeah, everything, everything is really working for me. Um, the line breaks are amazing. The, the pacing is really strong. Um, yeah, I've got nothing really constructive <laughs> to say about it. I really, um, I like the turn, like, and you undone, the word undone made my whole body melt um, say yes. And that transition then from like, yes, to, to whatever it is that needs to be done. Right. Um, and that transition from that moment to back to the yes, to the better or worse till death do us part, um, was like a really good turn. Um, yeah. And again, the idea of at 23, we didn't know what it meant kind of going back to that idea, uh, there's a lot of like time jumping, right? Um, which is fascinating. Um, and then the, the locked door and another locked door and another locked door just really <laughs> sealed it for me. Um, really, it ended really well. So yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any other comments, but I thought this poem felt pretty, pretty well, well, well done. Thank Did you, you have any questions? Marie, Mar Mar Mary, Mar Marie. Mary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> oh, okay. A universal question. Like that time I knew there was a question I couldn't answer and the boys were flummoxed as well about the meaning of the universe. It was just a day at the shore, three classmates on summer vacation, kids talking kids talk, our bodies open to the sun's rays, bare torsos, our heels digging into the sand, infinite grains running through our hands. It doesn't take much to make a 10 year old dizzy, like spinning, upended, even sick and scared. Just before life had been perfect, classic blue sky, calm of a repetitive ocean breaking before us. And then it was over. That minute seared into the brain circuitry. Kittens, when they see their reflections for the first time, will walk around the mirror trying to compass it. Every species surely has some moment to fathom a purpose. And then it's over. We move on, not out of boredom, but because of the day's exigencies. We walk home from the beach, play games indoors, argue. Who among us remembers that moment, becomes the astronomer or the poet bent on drawing lines through the sky? Thank you, Ronnie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am very excited about ending on that question um, and this idea that the people who who originally ask, you know, have that question and can't get over it, become the astronomers and the poets, right? Um, and everybody else just kind of moves on. Like that idea, like it blows my mind that you would have this moment and move on. I don't, I don't understand how. And I think that probably speaks to all of us here. Like that's why we're we're poets. That's why we do what we do. So I really love ending on that question. Um, <clears throat> 
I thought that there were a lot of moments where I was actually on the beach. I was digging my heels in the sand. I was feeling those grains of sand in my hand. Um, I felt those kids kind of owning the world in that moment. And I felt the perfection of it. Um, all of those images were so solid. Um, I could feel the sun on my own body reading it. Um, there's that great transition from, like, I love that line break even, um, and that it's a caesura there, that brain circuitry into the kitten's line. Um, I love that moment so much of, of turning into the kittens. Um, and again, like, speaking of like line breaks and the lines that are working, just that short sentence and then it's over, just ugh, really got me <laughs> in my core. Um, yeah, so I don't have anything necessarily like constructive revision wise to say, just that um, in general, it was very moving. And um, yeah, I really felt that through, like felt it when I read it. Well, wow, and thank you. And I think that you should know that um, you were talking in the last class about turns and I, I met with some of my friends and I said, what the hell is a turn? What the hell is a turn? And, um, and then all of a sudden um, I read um, something and I, I said, I think I know what a turn means. And if it hadn't been for you, Angela, and for Rick Borat, Barrett, no, oh, not yeah. Borat, Barrett, um, who, who was also influential in terms of how I structured this, I would never have written this. For me, this was a breakthrough, thanks to you. Oh, yay. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I'm so glad to hear that. Nice. <laughs> yes. And if, if anybody else doesn't know what a turn is, it's just like a moment in a poem where it, something unexpected happens and changes the way that you that you view the poem um it's or it can be like a yeah just like an unexpected thing that happens that just shifts your perspective a bit so yes thank you ronnie all right mary peters hi redundancy montana to wisconsin in our 75 in 75, our VW van rolled head over heels, spun end to end, black ice kicked that can. Then down the road and through the years, Wisconsin to Montana, US two wide load truck on truck, flatbed truck, hail bays strapped, excuse me, hay bales strapped beyond the bed, carries a pickup truck, flat tire stacked high with hay bales, rental car and driver shutter. Stanton Peak, I'm going to the sun. Pristine reflection floats on Lake McDonald. Clear down, going to the depth. Prisms ripple on the red rocks, green rocks. Snow on glacier, ice into river. Twin fawns, eyes blink. Thank you, Mary. Is it Mary Louise or Mary? Either is good. Okay. <laughs> um, so I especially like the very first stanza and that last stanza, I love how much happens with such, such, such small words, such a, like a little bit of space, right? Like just a little bit of space and a lot of things are happening there. Um, the head over heels and end to end, black, like all of that, I could just see it happening so easily. Um, so I really love that. And then again, at the end, the snow on the glacier, the ice into river, the twin fawns, like I imagined their eyes blinking at the same time and loved that image so much. It really stuck with me. Um, yeah. So I, I loved it. most of it was like really working for me. The only small question I had was like the set, the third stanza of the first section, um, I got a little confused on how the, I'm, I'm assuming it was another accident, but I'm getting confused about exactly what happened. Um, so there was a wide load truck on truck, but then what, like, was the I who was in the VW van also in this accident? I'm assuming so, but like, where 
square in this accident is the eye. Does that, does that make sense? Um, tricky, yeah, it was, the eye was the driver and passing this truck that was carrying a truck. It was very bizarre. So I can understand why that's confusing. Okay. A, big, like a huge truck carrying these hay bales, carrying another truck, which was also carrying hay bales. Maybe oh. not. Need <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you just for the sake of the poem, you could <laughs> get rid of one of the hay bale trucks. <laughs> um, yes, but otherwise it definitely worked. And I liked that. Um, I guess I liked the the juxtaposition of those two sets of images um, in, in the poem, like the sections one and two, the sets of images and the way they progressed was really fascinating to me. I really liked that. Um, yeah, and even clear down going to the depth prisms, ripple on red rocks, green rocks. Um, it was kind of sparse, but also it, it worked for me there. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Not right now, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think this is Fred's. Uh, I gotta scoot you guys over so I can see. Unmute. Grandchildren crying in the background. Never mind. Repavement. In springtime every year, when Eisenhower was president. The streets of our little Midwestern farm town were recovered with tar. First came the gravel trucks sprinkling out the back its load of stones over the winter worn asphalt road. Then came the tar truck, a steaming pot bellied rotund barrel covered in gooey black splashes of hot smelly lava, spitting out its fresh hot tar through the row of spigots just behind its own back wheels. The, star, the tar stuck to anything that touched it for days. Clothes, hands, bike tires, car wheel wells, animal paws. Most everyone hated it. It was a threat to car finishes, an impediment to getting to your house for a day, and a sleepless, stinky night, especially if the day had warmed up and windows were open for the evening's rest. But it marked spring. The lawns started needing hand mowing. The apple trees were blooming. Everywhere green leaves emerged. In dad's garden, little green puffs of potatoes, beans, lettuce, and radishes were emerging. And school would soon be out, which was as close to a feeling of emancipation that us kids from five to 18 would ever get. After a day, the gravel and tar would harden and become that year's layer added atop the many layers of years gone by. But after a summer of freedom and fun, fall came. And before the first cold snap and snow, trees bared themselves, we were recaptured by school, the residue of dad's garden laid in clumps, abandoned swatches of leftover leaves from potatoes, cucumbers, carrot tops, and onions left to fertilize for next year. Then when the sun cooled and daylight waned, we would rake what the trees had dropped, push those remnants into rounded piles and burn those brown tattered and crusty leaves atop that tar covered rope. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff happening here that is so great. Um, I it's like overall, I just love the idea that this really awful nasty process is the beginning of this like hopeful season right um and that you mark the time not by like not necessarily by the buds like that it doesn't start there where you would you would think that like if this is a poem about the changing of seasons you're thinking about right away the buds turning green and, and etc um but that this just starts with the the tar trucks right um i really love that mm -hmm. Um, and this is like man-made thing. It's not like a natural thing that happens. It's like, yeah. So anyway, I'd love that. Um, I love the end and how concise that is. And the idea that uh, like that it's kind of sad and nostalgic because like, oh, it's the end of the season, but knowing that they're going to retar it again is like a hopeful feeling, which is also very funny. This idea of like burning leaves in the road as a signifier for the changing seasons too is, is kind of fascinating. Um, I really like that. 
Um, also though, the idea that um, it was only when Eisenhower was president is interesting because that means like it only happened for that many years and then what? Um, so I thought that like there was a lot going on that I was really fascinated by and that just really put me into the heart of the poem. Um, all right, so all of that. And then I did like most of what I was thinking was there were just a lot of extra words maybe. So like the, there was like, then came the tar truck, a steaming pot bellied um, rotund barrel covered in gooey black splashes of hot smelly lava. <laughs> Um, and so I wondered about just like, because steaming already means that it's hot, right? So like a steaming pot bellied barrel covered in black splashes of smelly lava, um, just because like you still have all of that heat, but it just kind of tightens it up a little bit to give us a, a better picture of what it looked like, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, otherwise just, yeah, just like, trying to go through and find if there were any other things that can just be like extra words that can be cut or any redundancies in language um, to tighten it up. Um, but otherwise, I really, I really loved how that worked for me. Yeah, it was a good ride. Thank you very much. Yeah, do you have any questions at all? Any quick questions? No. Oh, okay. But someone else does. Uh, the Eisenhower thing is, I don't know how many people reading this would have a sense of when this is, when this kind of thing happened. I mean, it doesn't anymore. And so, uh, that, and that was an innocence of time. I was a little kid. I loved the smell. Uh, but I, I added that just to give it a mark in time so someone would say, oh, uh, if they came along after that, they could say that's the way they used to do it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I love that. Keep it. It's great. It's a great detail. It's very, it places it in time, like you said. It yeah, works. I, I wanted a time stamp there somewhere. I didn't have that at the beginning. I added it toward the end. Okay. It's a good one. Good choice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Janelle Clausen. Oops. So, in my girlhood in the southern Midwest, summer was stepping into a sauna, the humidity teasing out a corona of frizz around my head that I would slick down with hair gel, and there was so much light. I loved summer's longer days, though not the collapse of school structure, the scattering of pupils after the final bell. Years later in graduate school, I found an enclave of fellow lovers of words, of their sound and shape, how they could turn a person's inner world inside out. We did not need to explain to each other why we wrote words that no one might read or hear, that a story or poem has its own life. The summer solstice has the most daylight of the year. I find its sunset bittersweet thinking of the slow chipping away of the illuminated hours before the process has even started. Months before my final graduation day, I looked frantically in each direction my classmates would fly, and I saw the sun setting of lengthening days. New memories were weighted with the coming loss. A classmate asked me what I looked forward to after graduation, and I saw a cloudy midnight. But I moved on because I had to and grew where I landed. In the years after, there have been many summer solstices, new friends, old friends, fellow writers, and adventures. I learned that while a season lasts and after, there is still so much light in it. How when I saw night, it was because I had closed my eyes. Each perfect moment is its own and cannot be remade, but it can be lived in. Great, thank you very much. Um, I do really love the way that that the solstice kind of changes. Um, I, I guess like this idea of it being, I mean, it says like the sunset is bittersweet, right? Um, and I think that is kind of a key for me here that the idea that over time, your relationship with it kind of the sun kind of changes. 
Um, all of the details are working so well. I kind of pulled in right away um, with the humidity and this Corona frizz. Um, I loved the, I, I don't know, I just slicking it down with hair gel felt like I could, I don't, hair gel is such a visceral thing that I really enjoyed having that in, in the poem. Um, and it was also very, very funny to hear somebody say they weren't excited about summer, <laughs> um, and, right? And like how disappointing that was. Um, in that particular stanza, like the, the word pupils threw me out and I wondered about just using students just to keep it like tonally um, kind of the same vernacular. Um, and it also like the structure, the scattering of students, like there's just a little bit more alliteration there. Um, and like there was nothing, there were no like huge things that I was like, oh, this could be switched around or anything like that. Um, but there were just maybe some like smaller things that um, like, again, with some of the, some of the like words maybe could be like, instead of story or poem, maybe just say poem or story or no one might read. So like, like, so why we wrote words that no one might read that a poem has its own life, just to kind of make it a little bit more concise. Um, so just kind of watching out for extra words or words that maybe aren't absolutely necessary. Um, but otherwise, I especially loved the way that it ended. Um, I, I think I might consider cutting that like, but I moved on because I had to and grew where I landed um, and just started like, there have been many summer solstices since, and then new friends, old friends, um, something like that maybe. And otherwise, um, when I saw night, it was because I had closed my eyes. It's like my favorite idea in this poem. I love that so much. Um, yeah, and each perfect moment is its own and cannot be remade. Um, maybe a period there and then it can only be lived in, but like just suggestions, just throwing ideas out there. Um, yeah, I do really love all of the details though. There are a lot of really lovely things happening here. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thanks for people in the chat sharing your thoughts too. I appreciate it. Um, Julie Kramer. You might be muted, so unmute yourself. Sorry, had a little trouble with the unmuting. So. Okay, 8 a.m. Today I sit in front of my light box, 30 minutes, 18 min inches away. Early morning works best. A happy light, they call it. The latest tactic to remedy the creeping exhaustion that shadows my days. I remember a time when at 5 a.m. I was cheerily outside, bare feet in dew-drenched grass, swinging as high as I could go. I remember a time when at 6 a.m. I was in the gym, jazzercising away those 15 pounds that have always stood between me and happiness. I remember a time when at 7 a.m. on set every Saturday morning, I would call my mother on the hall, the phone down the hall from my room to talk about boys in midterms. I remember a time when at 6.30 a.m. I was standing in a snowbank in the dark, waiting for a bus to get to my laboratory first for dibs on the best equipment. I remember a time when by 8 a.m. I'd been up for four hours already with an insomniac toddler doing paperwork on the couch, Teletubbies theme song playing in the background. I remember a time, actually I'm black, let's see here. I remember a time when at 8 a.m. buried in comforters and flannel in our theoretically heated apartment, my husband could convince me there was no real hurry to leave the bed that early. I remember a time when at 7 a.m. I'd come downstairs to the smell of frying egg, toast in the toast. <coughs> My backpack packed sitting next to the kitchen table, my baby sister in her high chair bouncing with joy as she saw me. I remember a time when energy was not an issue, when there was more future ahead of me than past behind. 
the future boundless and full of opportunity. I tell myself this is sad, it's just a seasonal thing, not some harbinger of darker things to come, but I'm not sure it's true. Julie, I'm on a, a workshop tonight, so. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, um, yeah, so thank you very much for reading that. I really love the, well, first of all, I love the idea of sitting in front of that light box. I have one too. And mm -hmm. like, you just sit there and it's actually kind of depressing <laughs> to think <laughs> like, and I guess I hadn't really like thought about that cognitively um, until this poem. And I was like, wow, what a, like now you're just sitting there, um, and your mind's wandering to all these places. So anyway, I love that perspective. Um, I, all of these, stanzas have such great, great images. And like I felt like I was there for most of them. And, um, you know, like jazzercising away those 15 pounds that have always stood between me and happiness. Um, and this idea, I think in each stanza, it is clear that happiness at different times of your life looks different, which I really thought was interesting, especially considering that we're sitting in front of the happy light, right? Um, so I love the different ways, the different ways happiness looks over time um, as you get older. Um, what else? Um, so yeah, so then, uh, um, sorry, my notes are all scribbly because I only saw the second page first and thought that was the whole poem and then saw the that it started on a different page. So like, it's just a hot mess over here. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that as far as revision, um, I was the, I remember a time when lines, because those stanzas are so short, um, I wondered if there was a way to get out of just saying, I remember a time when, just because they take up like a considerable amount of space in such a tiny stanza, like for five, what is it? Like four or five, lines. Um, and so like, I wondered if you can do something like, I remember once at 5 a.m. Um, and then the next stanza just starts maybe like, and once at 6 a.m. Okay. And then at 7 a.m., something like that, just to switch that up a little bit, maybe. Um, yeah, but like ugh, the Teletubbies, man, I was there for that. Um, <laughs> Like this is like I like I was there for that. And I'm also there for that in this poem. Um, I guess the final thing I would say is in the end, I kind of wanted maybe just something, I don't know. Um, I, I felt like I already knew you knew that wasn't true. And so mm -hmm. I didn't need to be told that. So right. um, yeah, so I think I think that whole like last stanza and that last line, I kind of knew those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't have a suggestion on like okay. any helpful there, but I, mm -hmm. I felt a little like, oh, everything else was so vivid and dense. And then mm -hmm. I just felt like I wanted something more. Okay, all right. Yeah, I have a lot of times trouble figuring out how to wrap things up, so. Um. Yeah. And I think it was smart to head back to the beginning, um, maybe mm -hmm. thinking more about, instead of focusing on the, on the seasonal affective disorder specifically, maybe focusing more on the idea of the light or um, mm -hmm. some, maybe some image of the, like maybe put us back in front of that light with you and like, what do you see out of the corner of your eye or what right. do you see above it or something beyond. Right in the future, I don't, just throwing things out there now. No, no, actually I, I hadn't thought of that, but going back in front of the light would be a really good way to wrap it up. Like, yeah. I think in general for everyone, if you're ever struggling with your ending, think like, is there a way I can get back to the beginning? And sometimes that really helps just like get you to the right ending. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Katrina? The shore of me, pain rolling in like the tide, subtle at first, then undeniably surrounding me, crashing on me, covering everything, obliterating the rocks and sand, the grit of who I am, everywhere and endless. No more peaceful shore, no happy picnic, 
no sunshine sand. Covered in cold despair, I cry for what is gone and changed forever. Slowly, slowly the tide of pain recedes. Bits and pieces of shoreline reemerge. A familiar rock in shifted sand, the same tree under a new sun. The shore of me still there, forever changed, yet still me. I am left to discover the shore anew, a healing piece emerging from the aftermath of storm. Thank you. Um, for some reason, I can't find copy that I printed, um, but what I do know is that um, I love the way, obviously, like formally, this mimics a wave, um, even, not even like just the form, but because of its shape, it starts slow and then kind of gradually picks up pace and then like kind of slowly goes back to like a slower pace. Um, I love that so much. Um, let's think, um, I'm trying to remember what else I wrote. Oh, here it is, okay. Um, all right, so I wondered if, there was a way to, I guess I, I wondered if there was a way for the title maybe to be more telling of, like, I was curious about the kind of pain we're talking about. Um, I liked the way that like the grit, right? The sand and the grit of who I am and this idea that forever changed yet still me. Um, I loved that like analogy that really was working well. Um, yeah, I, but I, yeah, I think that if the, maybe the title could be just tweaked a little bit to give us a little bit more either detail or a little bit more tension. Um, but I do really, yeah, but everything else is working really well. Um, yeah, this healing piece emerging. There was, I don't know, all of the images were working really well. I feel like, I always feel like I'm not doing my job when I don't have a lot of like helpful <laughs> things to say, but like, but I think it's just like generally really working um, for you. Um, I love No Happy Picnic, which can maybe come across in some contexts as cliche, but I think here it really works. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, if anybody else has more stuff in the comments, but um, do you have any questions that you specifically were thinking of? No, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Jocelyn Boer? Don't forget to unmute yourself. There we go. Can she you hear me now? Oh, there she, yep, there she is. Okay. Remembering forever. Did you ever have a day you believed you would remember forever? Promised yourself you would never forget? And then you forgot the details while recalling you had those days and you longed to recapture them? My memory, like yours, holds those days along with the many slights and hurts and traumas that I would like to forget, but efforts fail. And I often unexpectedly recall these with pain. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I love that this poem engages the reader like outright. Um, this, you know, call to the second, the second person to the you, right? Um, did you ever have a day you believed you would remember forever? And I'm like, I think most of us probably have, right? Like everyone? I'm not sure. Um, but there are definitely those days. And then you inevitably probably do forget a lot of them. Um, yeah, well, a lot of the days you prefer not to remember are still very vivid to you. Um, so I do, I really love this in, in and of itself, right? These ideas. Um, if 
you wanted to push it further, um, ways that you might do that would be um, like, what are some of those days that you do remember? Um, or what kinds of like, what would that look like to have that kind of day? Like for me, I remember, like I've heard this so many times where people are like, um, you'll never remember like the last time you picked up, your, like gave your kid a piggyback ride, right? And so like, I always try now to like, every time I give my kid a piggyback ride, be very <laughs> aware just in case that's the last time. Um, and so if there maybe is a way to tease out some details of what those days might look like, that might be interesting. Um, but otherwise, like I really appreciate the thoughts and the way that those that those thoughts progress here. Thank you very much for the comments. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Lindsay Woodward? Yeah, we a word, but that's fine. We a word, okay. <laughs> it's just yes, like please please correct me if I get your names wrong. It's just like read a word. It's a sentence, you know. <laughs> After Clara's passing, an eagle waits over a frozen field of snow after the funeral. I pull into the driveway, shake off my boots at the back door. Heat would be helpful in tea form or another log in the fireplace. I sit at the writing desk to notice what the pause brings. Clouds prevent the sun from glistening off a frosted pane, a pole, the trees, a fence. The cat on the stair, absent the afternoon sun, curls into itself. The urge to cry goads me until I bark out a contralto strain. A kindly tissue softens the tension. Past the shivering, is a deep well of calm. Thank you, Susie. Um, I love how quiet and patient this poem is. Um, I love the pacing so much and it feels completely appropriate to the mood of the poem. Um, it, that opening image is really fantastic, right? This eagle waiting over a frozen field of snow um, yeah, so I love everything happening there. Um, so many images. It, uh, it feels, um, I don't know, like when you do have one of those, like after a funeral or something, things become very vivid in like bursts, I think, and that that's very clear here. Um, yeah, and this, this desire to have the heat and to be comforted by something. Um, I loved all of that. Um, the images are just generally wonderful. Um, I wondered about um, just maybe like just little things, right? Like changing, like heat would be helpful in tea form or another log in the fireplace. Um, instead of just saying like, I pour myself a cup of tea and put another log in the fireplace, just something a little more um, just kind of syntactically similar to the rest of the poem, I guess. Um, and then I don't know that I wanted the tissue sentence and like people can fight with me about that in the chat, but it felt too, um, too happy. <laughs> like, and not, not that it was happy, but it sounded like friendly tissue sounded just like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think you could move straight from that contralto strain and then past the shivering is a deep well of calm. Um, mm -hmm. Or if there's another image that might echo that feeling to put at the end, just because it is an image dense poem. Um, again, bringing that back to an image would also be really great just because you're very good at them. So that's kind of where, where I am. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. Ed Block. Where I am, Ubi Sunt. Back then, the apples in the orchard ripe, the acorns and the berries of the mountain ash as well. We ran in jeans and flapping flannel shirts with slingshots, aimed the acorns and the berries at each other. And after dark, built bonfires in the swamp. Now I wait for colder days with apprehension, 
watch the weather forecasts, migratory birds. I mark the dying gardens, burning leaves. The neighbor's tree that overnight it seems drops gold to form a carpet on the lawn. Back then, the neighbor's cousin, nubile, game to wrestle with us boys. Where is she now? Our fires in the swamp, the snares we used to trap the hares whose red urine trails led to their homes beneath the piles of earth we roasted whole. Back then, the candles of our lives burned bright and hot. Our days were shaped by passion and desire. Now I watch the falling, the fading streetlights as they wink off, old men closing sleep-filled eyes. And now my days are ending with a question. What is left? The fire is nearly out, pooled wax around a candle's base, while yet the stubborn wick still glows the edge of darkness that's my soul thank you ed um yeah this is lovely um and is definitely working with time in a great way kind of that back and forth is really really powerful um i think my favorite is like our fires in the swamp the snares we use to trap the hares oh and the red urine trails which at once like made me bristle like eh, but also it was so so visually stimulating right like it was a really intense image um and then roasting that rabbit hole was like it just it felt like I was there right I got I got a sense of being in those in those woods um yeah so or next to this in the swamp but I I felt woodsy in the swamp um yeah so loved all of that loved the way that it was changing I loved the way that like paying attention to the seasons changes in this poem. Um, the metaphor of the old men closing their sleep filled eyes when the lights go out. Um, I loved that too. Um, all right, so then I think there were, I feel like if I could show you what I'm saying, it would make more sense than me trying to explain it. But I wondered about just like moving some lines around to make things transition more easily. So that um, back then the apples in the orchard ripe and then um, we ran in jeans and flapping flannel shirts and put the like put, because you have the acorns and berries in two different lines, kind of combine them in a line so that it's something like um, we loaded the slingshots with acorns and berries or and aim them at each other, something like that. Um, and let's see, what else? Um, yeah, and then at the end, oh, yeah, at the end, maybe getting rid of the the question, um, maybe getting rid of that first line and just kind of starting with the fires nearly out, pooled wax around a candle's base, while yet the stubborn wick still glows. Um, I think ending on that image is maybe a good way, I because I love that idea of the stubborn wick, like glowing still. Um, I wonder about ending there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Shona? Hi, um, hey. on the rope bridge, swaying serrated shadows where there must be trees, parallel ropes seem to meet in the distance, droplets scintillate on mist. Look into abyss, swallow, soar above yourself, standing small, shoot, cutting into your fist, blood pulsing. What made you rush into the middle and only then stop, look back at beginnings, learn there is no guide, no one beside you. Take one step, then another. Hold fast, carry on. Reunion beckons. Thank you, Shana. That was a lovely reading. That was so nice. Um, so my first my first excitement about this poem is that it looks like a rope bridge, right? Like this nice, tight, straight line. Um, I really like that. And 
um, just right away in the first stanza, I was very anxious and could feel the stress of like the, sw like, I don't know, a swaying rope bridge is terrifying to me. Um, so I felt like I was there. Um, and then, yeah, it moved, the way it moves is great. The juke cutting into your fist, like again, felt that so strong. Um, and then what else? Yeah, I thought it was great. Just, just generally, everything was great. The pacing felt like taking one step at a time, like the way you would go across the bridge. Um, I love when you get stuck in the middle, like um, I wondered about maybe making a line, like a stanza break when you're stuck in the middle, just because like you would be stuck there for a minute. Um, and then I also wondered about the last line, the reunion beckons. I wasn't sure about the reunion. I, like I wasn't sure what it meant exactly. Um, so either I thought pulling more out of that, um, like, or cutting it and ending at like, take one step then another or cutting it and ending at there's no guide, no one beside you maybe. Um, yeah, so either taking it further or cutting it, I think was my, were my feelings about it. Thank you. It's, it's from a collection that's called the Book of Condolences. Okay. So that's where the reunion sort of comes in. Oh, got it. Okay, nice. Yes, very lovely. Thank you. Elizabeth Torres. Hi, Riddle, when I was a girl, I whispered, let me tell you my loves, my passions, and my fears. With you alone, I shared the name of my firstborn child, Julia, my favorite colors, a sketch of my high school crush, a drummer with long hair and thick lips like Mick Jagger's. To you, I revealed my destiny to be a painter. I vowed to go to the sea if the darkness ever consumed me. At night, I'd lock you up and hide the key inside a little yellow pillow, safe from six siblings. A young woman, I wanted you in black and white, like the French movies I loved, perfect bound. I piled you high, shut you in a box like Pandora's. I scrawled impossible stories, snippets of dialogue, fervent prayers, and alchemical formulae, cacophonies of crows, murders of caresses, dreams of embroidered denim wedding dresses. Once I built a cedar chest to house you in and promptly lost the key. It crouches in the basement, a 40-year-old coffin that taunts, open me. Today, I scribble random notes in narrow lined scarlet notebooks, college bound, that I kidnapped to my isolated home in the woods. Obsessed, I mark you every day, squaring sphinx with larynx, fiddle with muddle and ladle. I'm no longer afraid of losing you, since nothing rhymes almost perfectly with everything. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I love the relationship between the speaker and this journal or diary. Um, like I, I feel like it's a, like it's a real love story. Um, they've been through everything together. Um, and to be invited into as the audience of this poem, like the reader is essentially kind of acting as, as the journal, right? Um, because while you are sharing these things, you're sharing these things with us that like otherwise you've only shared with the journal, um, which is like just really letting the reader in. And I love that. I love all of the details, um, the name Julia and the thick lips like Mick Jagger. Um, yeah, this the black and white French movies, right? Um, yeah, I love all of the ways that this journal kind of transitions over time alongside the speaker. Um, I love the the line cacophonies of crows and murders of caresses. Um, the in that last stanza, kidnap, kidnapped and obsessed. Um, yeah, in general, like I thought it was mostly all working here. So 
Um, I, yeah, I think if anybody else has lots of stuff to say in the chat, definitely include it there, but I, it worked mostly really well for me. So yeah. Did you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Annette Grunseth. Okay. This is ordinary days. We promised in sickness and health through the depths and heights of our experiences, to love until death do us part. After the I do's, we assumed heights, not depths, only good times ahead, forever young and healthy. I could not have known I would hold my mother's hand for two weeks in a hospice until she was gone. I could not have known my brother would die young from war-related cancer. Then you would get war cancer but survive after six months of chemo, two ambulance rides, and two stays in intensive care. We've endured knee replacements, cataract implants, hand surgery, a pacemaker, and two small strokes. Grateful to take care of each other. Coming out on the other side, repaired, restored. When did we realize it was half over? Each birthday moving the notch of halfway ahead. 35, 40? 45? It does not compute. We have outlived our grandparents. Our parents are gone. It happens so quickly to be next in line. Our job now to enjoy ordinary days. This tree, this hammock in the breeze, these kayaks on quiet water, autumn's gold light on a wooded trail, the dry cold night of this January full moon. Thank you, Annette. Um, yeah, those, especially that last stanza is so, so rich. I love all, like all the things happening here in general um, are working really hard um, and just are, yeah, they, they hit hard, right? Um, the sad things that happen are very sad here. And yeah, they're, they're, it's, a, it's an intense poem, right? It's, it's really great. Um, so I guess what I loved was the way that, like that we can never really imagine what is to come, right? Um, that you kind of have this lofty idea of what life will be like when you're young and you never think of these like really terrible, tragic things. Um, and so I really appreciate that in this poem and how that moves, moves through. Um, I wondered about putting, so like that, the lines, when did we realize it was half over each birthday moving the notch of halfway ahead? Um, those lines, I wondered about putting them right after the first stanza as like a way to transition from, from the I do's and then into the mother. Um, and, and kind of moving that way might just transition into that a little bit more smoothly. Um, and even then, instead of, instead of saying like, I could not have known I would hold my mother's hand, um, you know, going from like the 35, 40, 45, it does not compute. Um, and then I held my mother's hand for two weeks in hospice until she was gone and leaving that just be a statement instead of, I think I could have, I could not have known just makes it feel a little bit. I mean, I think, I think this, the reader realizes that you didn't know that's what would happen um, without saying it. And so I think it just kind of like makes it a little bit more intense, like the moment was, does that make sense? Yes. Were you saying to put the 30 and 40 and 45, does that come put that in with the, when did we realize it was half over? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So like that whole, when did we realize okay. up through it does not compute, put that right after the first stanza maybe and see okay. how that looks. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. I, yeah. It's a good idea. I love that idea. Like it's something I think about regularly too, where I'm like, am I, ha like, am I over the hill officially? Like how do I know? <laughs> yeah. So um, yes. Thank you very much, Annette. I, I really enjoyed this. Okay, good, thank you. I appreciate your, your comments, it's very helpful. Thanks. Heidi?
Don't forget to unmute. Yes, hi, I got it now. All right. Witness. I watched the succession of spring in flowers begun with crocus, then forsythia, lilac scent, bridal wreath, daffodil, on until out of school, graduate and become carefree summers done. Now it's scylla, bluebells, forsythia burst, lilac, bride's white spray, still the daffodil, onto tulips, roses, iris, gems. And with that yellow burst array, see kinglets range through, ruby crown, surprise tree charms, spark and move on to summer right rendezvous, graduate and become witness caring one. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I really love this unfolding of the flowers um, and how they change over time, like what is paid attention to is different. Um, also the idea of carefree summers done is so, it's a funny idea to me because um, like, it's kind of weird that we used to just have off all summer and then suddenly we don't have off all summer. <laughs> like, like, that's really awful. <laughs> <laughs> should have off all summer, everyone. Um, yeah, so I love that idea too. Um, I guess I was curious about, in the end, the idea of becoming witness and the caring one um, was like, was the speaker not caring before? Like, how did that, how did the transition, I guess the, the idea of the caring one, I was curious about. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it, it used to be you were so carefree and now it's changed. It's okay. not necessarily bad or worse. It's just that now I care for others a lot more than you used to as a kid. Yes. You I take care of people and everything. So. Yeah, I love that. And I wonder, can you put more people like the caring for others in there maybe? I Because what I was really excited about, I love when we see the kinglets and those surprise tree charms. Um, yeah, that summer right rendezvous, like that's so beautiful, like those little pops of color happening. Um, I'm, I'm interested though in this idea of becoming a person who has to not just pay attention, uh, who maybe doesn't have those carefree days to watch the things, right? And has to be the one who cares for things instead of being carefree. Like that's interesting to me. So maybe in this poem, or maybe that's another poem, but I really like that idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I could expand upon that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Linda? Big black trunk. When the seasons changed, my three older sisters and I would dive into the big black trunk in our upstairs pull out all the clothes, heap everything onto a bed, and appraise our chances of finding items we could wear to school. Most of the clothing dated back to Michigan cousins. A few newer items presents from an aunt. As the youngest child, I had many options, few of them appealing. Skirts could be too short, too long or just too worn out. Never mind, out of style. This trunk belonged to our Finnish grandmother who immigrated to Michigan's UP in 1895. Ironically, she arrived with this trunk filled with her clothes and the tools of her trade. She was a seamstress. She opened a shop and made dresses, even beautiful wedding gowns for Finnish immigrants. Once she married, she made and sold clothing from their home, but failed to pass on her skill to our mother, her youngest daughter. Are you a foreign exchange student? A substitute teacher once asked one of my sisters, our clothes set us apart. Our working father grew up poor, a double whammy, he lived through the Great Depression. Money was to save not to spend frivolously on anything as foolish as clothes. 
Once we sisters could babysit and earn our own money, we bought blouses, sweaters, and skirts as our funds allowed. A luxury to walk into a store, select items from racks of clothing, go into a changing room, try things on, buy something new, hang it up in the closet at home, admire it, wear it, clothes that fit and that we had chosen. Today, most of the local clothing stores have closed due to COVID-19 and online shopping, but I finally fondly remember those stores that experience options, options, dazzling array of clothing. Now I shelter wearing old jeans and fleeces. My childhood prepared me for this, a closet full of old clothes that will see me through. Thank you, Linda. Um, the, there is so much to love here. Um, yeah, the movement is really great. Um, I love that there are some like funny things, right? Like I had many options, few of them appealing. Um, I love that humor there. Um, I also like laughed out loud about, are you a foreign exchange student? Like that's really like that really gave me a good sense of what you were wearing <laughs> or what your sister was wearing. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, yeah, and then also like that turn at the end was really unexpected. Um, this now I shelter wearing old jeans and fleeces. Um, and I really liked that. I liked how that shifted into the present day and how child that, that childhood experience prepared you for that. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, overall, like all of the images were great and I felt like I was there all the time. Um, the only thing I might suggest is just trying to cut words to make it less prosaic maybe. Um, so like, so when, when the seasons changed, my sisters and I would dive into the big black trunk, pull out all the clothes, like, so get rid of the things that maybe aren't necess necessary to understanding the poem and um, I think that just makes the, like the punch of those images a little stronger um, if we get them a little bit, if they come a little bit faster. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love the story, the narrative that happens here um, and the Finnish grandmother and um, yeah, this idea of these girls like rummaging through these clothes every, yeah, it, lots of great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an hour later. I got to go. Thank you, Angela, and everybody else. Enjoyed it muchly. Thank you. See you, Fred. Jan. The photographer. Since he was a young editor, he has noticed the subtle changes in the oaks, the sky, the lakes, has trekked all four seasons through woodlands and wetlands with his Nikon or Pentax slung over his back. But now he falls, has fallen, has put his house up for sale while move into assisted living. Though aging, he still enjoys changes in the oaks, the sky, the lakes, still wants to amble where he once strode. So he bought a walker with big wheels and a seat. It's working pretty well, he says, except on the downslopes. The coneflowers welcome him. They don't care about the walker. They just want to have their picture taken. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah, I love that. I love the way that ends, right? Um, and the way that the things that you, you love when you are younger, in this case, like the, the photographer loves when he's younger, like those things just stay with you, right? And those are like kind of your life force and the things that like, no matter what, like I need to do those to feel alive, right? Um, and so I kind of, I got the sense, that kind of sense about, um, about this man who's like, I need to be able to do this. Um, I really love that. Um, yeah, what else here? The, um, the walker wheels and the cone flowers, um, thought those were all really wonderful images. Um, 
I think, so one thing that I wondered about was um, instead of just kind of giving the, um, like he's noticed the subtle changes in the oaks, the sky, the lakes, and then kind of repeating that again in the second stanza, I really wanted to see a photo he had taken. Like, are there ways to show how he maybe captured those subtle changes or um, also like, is, how does he feel about going into ass assisted living? I, I kind of wanted a little bit more of his personality. And I think just like a few little extra details might give the reader that. Um, again, just like specific photos maybe that he has taken or, um, or yeah, just, I don't like, I can't get a sense if he's ornery or not. And I want to know if he's ornery. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think those were my main like feelings. Like I really enjoyed the poem as a whole, um, but just wanted like a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy. Don't forget to unmute yourself. I'm not sure if she is here. Well, why don't we move on and then she can, we'll give her another chance at the end. So, Sarah. Cancer, love and hope in the afternoon. You come beside my bed to whisper love as I lie weakened by my tumored nerves. A feeling, a white swath of zilk above floats on a breeze and touches me with curves so briefly what your words declare down low. I know my mind and so my body's grief. I lift my heart to your soft sound in coet and the silken hum of your voice in brief creates. Your murmur, dear, inspire my hope. Your murmurs, dear, inspire my hope. I ask for pillows covered with blue silk. I think I smell your body, cantaloupe, a subtle scent with gentle orange tilt. Towards the earth, away from heaven's hunger, I on chiffon glide, so love's breath won. Thank you, Sarah. This is, whoops, can everybody hear me? Hear a, okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I, this is just gorgeous. Um, the silk, I love the way, like the, t the, the senses here, like the sensuality of like the touch, right? The silk, um, the, t the, excuse me, the, um, the chiffon, right? The silken hum of your voice, um, the smell of the body. And I mean, let's just take a minute to like appreciate these rhymes, right? This rhyme scheme and this form is gorgeous um, and impressive. Like I, yes, I, I love this whole thing. I don't have anything that's, that's not just like really loving this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if anybody else has something more constructive or like helpful, but I think it's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any specific questions, Sarah, that you wanted answered? Well, I uh, enjoy writing sonnets and um, I did experiment a little bit um, with, for example, in coit. 
and you know splitting the word but it it, it, it worked well for, it worked well for rhyming and it was kind of fun to do um, not that this is a poem that asks for fun but from a structural point of view I guess I could say it it gave me a chance to experiment a little bit and I I feel it did work so I'm glad you didn't criticize me for that <laughs> yeah no that definitely worked I, I liked that oh that was good that was a good choice great <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Sarah <laughs> my pleasure thank you okay we're gonna give Lucy another chance to read it's hard to for me to tell if she's on the call because there's so many Lynn Aprils. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we timed that pretty well. High five, Angela. I can't believe we did that. I <laughs> I was going really fast and whew. Um, so I feel like I didn't give everyone their due just their do just I can't even talk anymore, but I I feel like I I should have done, I would have done better had there been more time, but hopefully some of the things were helpful. And mm -hmm. um, I think hopefully everybody just enjoyed reading everybody else's work because I did, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, did, maybe, uh, do you have any closing words? And then we'll say, have a great evening to everybody. Um, oh my gosh, I, I don't, I don't have anything really, I feel like I should have prepared something. Um, I just expected, I thought that I would be talking poems until we <laughs> had to shut <laughs> it down here. So um, I guess just thank you all so much for coming. It was really, really wonderful to get to know you through your work. And um, I hope I will see you around maybe at the uh, WFOP conference or um, like in the community. Um, if you're in Milwaukee and there's something happening at Woodland Pattern, I'll probably see you there. There. Um, but definitely, yeah, look out for me where, wherever you happen to be in the world and I might show up. Angela, will you be um, doing any more workshops and would you put us on a mailing list if you're going to be out and about um, doing some things in the community? Yes, sure. Um, yes, I am definitely happy to put anybody on a mailing list. Um, the best way to do that um, Tori, can they send? I can. I can send you a list of all the participants. Yeah. That's yeah. the easiest. The easiest. Perfect. Yeah, well, that and, sounds good. And one more question: Do you do any private coaching for? I do. Poetry? I do. Yep. Um, I have some information about that. I think that information is on my website. So okay. it's angelavorishills.com. Um, yeah. So. Great. Thank you so much. It was really great. I love everyone's poems. <laughs> it was so good. Yeah. It yeah, always thanks. Was... Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go, go ahead. No, I'm just going to work. It my mind so great of poets, like just like exist out in this world. It makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to. I do also want to thank everybody for participating. And I will have this recording and any other helpful links on the website uh, probably within the week. And then the next workshop is can, is scheduled for June and July. And then I do, I also hope to see people at the WFOP conference in April. So thank you. Thank you, Tori. Right. Thanks so much. Angela. Thank, thank you, Tori. Thank you, Tori. Angela. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you, everybody. Evening. Angela, I will thank you, Tori and Angela. Okay, sounds good. Have a good Thanks, night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>